Just that. We don't need to know any more. The whole parish shares her anxiety. Well, we're always concerned for his safety, of course. It's because there's a good explanation for it, and uh, we'll hear it soon. One explanation is the bishop is left with a woman. His colleagues can't confirm it. There are rumours around, and we, we can't really co comment upon them because we don't know, we don't know anything. Today, like the last six, the bishop's house lies empty. Why he left here remains a mystery. The local community and the church have renewed their appeal to the bishop to get in touch. The people want to know he's safe, so too does the church. But it also seeks answers to other questions. Does the Bishop of Argyll intend to resign, and if so, why? Linda Kennedy, ITN, in the West Highlands. And that's the news tonight from me and the ITN weekend team. Good night. Hello, good evening. High pressure has given most of us a fine sunny day today. It's going to stay close by over the next few days, so in many respects the weather's staying just the same. It's edging just a little to the north and east, and that will allow one change. It'll allow the winds to freshen up a little bit from the south and east, so there will be rather more breeze over the next few days, but still generally dry and sunny weather for most of us. Let's come back to tonight, though. It's going to be another chilly night tonight, not quite as cold as recent nights, down to around 7 for most of us, and that's about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, sunny skies again across most of Britain, a few wisps of cloud here and there, mostly across the north and west, but even there, breaks in the cloud and some sunshine. So it's sunshine for most of us, and after that chilly start, temperatures rising fairly swiftly up to around 21 in the afternoon. That's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It will feel cooler around the coasts with the breeze off the sea, but the winds at their strongest down in the south and west. Quite a fresh southeasterly breeze there, and that's going to be a feature of the weather for many of us over the next two or three days. But the sunshine and the dry weather will be there as well. So enjoy it. A fine day tomorrow. Good night. Sponsored by PowerJet. Generating electricity, whatever the weather. Hollywood star, soap queen and courtroom dramatist. Everyone has one book in them, but her life could fill volumes. Tomorrow, live, a GMTV exclusive with Joan Collins. And will there ever be an oasis of peace? Get the inside story from Noel and Liam's brother Paul, live tomorrow morning. LWT Weather, sponsored by First Choice Holidays, for a brighter outlook. Good evening. We're settling into a pattern at the moment of sunny days and quite chilly nights. Temperatures tonight falling to 6 Celsius, 43 Fahrenheit. A couple of mist patches lurking around, but unless you're up very early, I don't think you'll notice them. Taking a look at tomorrow morning, well, lots of sunshine around, but feeling pretty chilly first thing. But as we head into the afternoon, temperatures reaching 20 Celsius. That's 68 Fahrenheit with perhaps the odd little wisp of cloud around. That's it for now. See you next week. For a detailed forecast, call Weather Update, sponsored by First Choice Holidays on 0891 11 0000. Next tonight, we launch the 20th season of the South Bank Show with a profile of Victoria Wood. My name is Sonny Morea, and I was the Lunar Roving Vehicle Project Manager for NASA. I remember when we were designing it, we knew it had to be aluminum, incredibly strong, yet 60% lighter than steel. It wasn't very luxurious, and it cost them $40 million. And that's when $40 million was a lot of money. Yeah, aluminum cars have come a long way since the space age. Yeah, Under Eurostar, you have the freedom to move, to think, to work, to breathe. Je me and so I have to ask myself, does a bird in a cage sing as sweetly as a bird who is free?
What is the answer? The answer is a goldfish. Where do I find my goldfish? On the end of the line. Call 0990 60 90 60. Your Unigate milkman. The guy you can rely on. Coming soon to a screen near you. A story that spans three centuries, from 18th century Virginia to present-day Manchester. Starring Robson and Jerome as the daring duo, Helen Mirren as the tough cop. He knows my name. And an all-star cast, drama premieres. Just when you thought life wasn't dramatic enough, if you only watch one television channel, make it ITV, Britain's most popular button for drama premieres. For the best days of the week, this is LWT. The South Bank Show, in association with the Sunday Telegraph, the art of a perfect Sunday. In a moment, the South Bank Show's 20th season opens with Victoria Wood. I actually thought, you know, that 3,000 people putting their coats on and locking their front doors and getting into their cars just to see me, I'd have stage well, fright. Two to come up over ten seconds. Follow spots the snap on up stage left and announcement. I just hey, really tune myself up to do it because I've got to give out so much energy to all those people and I've got to be ready to do it. OK, I can't think of any reason not to start. I've wanted to be famous since I was tiny. I can remember that from before I was five, wanting to be famous. Please welcome Victoria Wood. You know, this is where I tried to get all those years ago, and now I'm here, and the least I can do is enjoy it, you know, and I do really make the most of it, and I think that gives me an extra edge on the stage. Hello. Well, here we are then, we made it. We're out of the house, we got here. We said, that's it, Tuesday, we're coming out. <laughs> no more sitting in front of the television, eating pizza straight out of the box. Scraping cold mozzarella off the lid two hours later, we're coming out. We want glimmer, glitter, excitement. This is Blackpool, we'll have to come to Winter Gardens. <laughs> Welcome to lovely St Albans. I was here last week, but before that, I hadn't been here for ages and ages. When I got here, the manager said to me, do you notice any differences? I said, no. <laughs> and he said, oh, we've put a new pedal bin in the ladies' labs, and um, <laughs> we've called it an arena. I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> and I got here this afternoon, there's one fan letter waiting for me at the stage door. It said, dear Miss Wood, I will never forget the last time you came to Manchester at the Opera House. We waited for you at the stage door in the rain. You came out, barged past us, got into your car, and reversed into my sister's Renault. <laughs> I don't think I've seen a cleaner Cortina. He washes it more than his Hello. I said, can I see the doctor? She said, I'm afraid that's not possible. I said, well, can you draw me a picture of him? <laughs> Just two coffees, no sweet. Nice plate of brains and a ginger nut. I used to drink uh, battery acid. Oh, no, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> she said, you're real father. He's actually a right prominent rhythm guitarist. She had postnatal depression. She showed me the baby. <laughs> and then I had it as well. <laughs> Next week, then, Philippa will be showing us how to stitch up the mouth of a talkative friend or relative. She curtsied, then, looking up to the familiar faces in the gallery, kissed her hand. The applause grew deafening, and gradually the people rose in their seats, still clapping. The theatre stood and cheered instantly. 
while Lynn bowed and smiled for an eternity. Victoria Wood was Britain's first female stand-up comedian and she remains the biggest crowd puller in the country. She was recognised on the television programme New Faces and went on to sing her comic songs every week on That's Life in the mid-70s. Since then, she's been acclaimed as an actress, a playwright, a TV sketchwriter and screenwriter. She's dedicated this year to a national tour which has its climax next week at the Albert Hall in London. Director Nigel Watches followed her as she created her one-woman show and took it on the road. But we caught up with her as she arrived in Blackpool, near the beginning of the tour. Well, this is the third weekend, so it's not... No, I'm not, I'm not nervous now. I'm really, really glad to have got it all together. Leicester was great, Sheffield was great, Ipswich was great. Blackpool, you know, I don't know what it's going to be like. This is the first time I've come away without any children. So this is the first time I've had to leave them both in school, which I feel a bit lousy about. It's much more fun if I can have them with me, but I think it's better for them if they stay behind. Oh, here we are. Blackpool Opera House in the Winter Gardens is the largest theatre in England, with nearly 3,000 seats. Only three solo performers can fill it consistently, Shirley Bassey, Ken Dodd, and Victoria Wood. Wood tours with just one old suitcase for her props and makeup. I don't think I've been here before. You know, I think I've done the other one. Which one's this? The, 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 the opera house. Oh, perhaps, I think, perhaps I have. Is this the one where they have yeah. the ballroom dancing? She has a stage manager and a sound engineer. And that's the entire tour party. Well, if he's been here before, then I yeah. So which is this? This is the new, the new Yamaha. I've had that blue suitcase for ages and ages. I've had the fold with the, with the jokes in. I've had since 1983. You know, I've kept a lot of the same things over the years since I first started working in about 82 or 80. I'm not superstitious, but there's something I don't. I like old things. I don't like to get new things just for the sake of it. I just. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to have the same things around you. Some of these bushes are ancient. I woke up really, really late this morning, so I'm shouting at my children. Because one of them has been really stupid, you know, he wouldn't get dressed. So I overreacted. I've had him adopted. <laughs> No, it's all right, I'm going to collect him from the social services tomorrow. When you go on stage, how much do you, as it were, make up a new character, that, that you are a different Victoria Wood? I don't. I yeah. don't. I mean, Did I you... feel that that's me on stage. Yeah. I'm not... It's Did you not used to do act. that? No. No, I used to feel that the real me was on the stage and the rest of me was fumbling to catch up that when I was on stage, I was talking honestly and communicating with people that I had difficulty doing the rest of the time. How are you doing? Lights? Yes? He's still focusing. Yeah, OK. Does anyone want to do a sound check? Yeah. Well, One, two, three, four, five, six. We try that with a bit of aerobics. Yeah. Just to check your monitors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Hi! Sorry I'm late. Welcome to Step. I'm Hayley Bailey. Welcome to Step with Hayley Bailey. I'm very much in love with the simplicity of being a stand-up comic. You know, there's no... We have lights, but we don't have a set. We just have a piano. We just bring the audience in. We just do it. You know, it's a very simple operation. We'll take the greens down a bit and see what that looks like. I don't want it any less bright, really. How do you see the audience? I don't want to see them at all. I want them to be a black mass. I want them to be an audience that I can get a sense of. I don't want them to be particular people. 
rest of the day. Think maybe would care. I spend <sighs> from about five o'clock, maybe for an eight o'clock show. It's sort of tough to get. Sort of practicing on the stage and walking around, getting the feel of the, the stage and the shape of the auditorium, and going going through the songs and warming up my voice, such as it is, and just get, getting into the mood because it can be. I'm not wishing to sound like the sad clown. It can be quite lonely because there's nobody else to do it. I've got to do it. It just gives me a feel of the of the building and the the shape of the auditorium. I just I like being on stage, stage struck. <laughs> Victoria Wood was born in 1953 near Bury in South Lancashire. The first of two houses where she grew up was in a terrace on the Tottington Road. My house is that one on the end there with the stream and the roses. My main memory of being in this house has been in that bedroom up there and, there was a, and I was sitting in bed reading books because I was a compulsive reader even then. I don't remember having any friends. I don't remember anybody coming to the house or anything like that. I just used to play with my sisters mainly. But, like, the social life hadn't really kicked into gear. And then it never did, because then we went up to this big house on the hill and, and nobody came to tea at all. <laughs> we had to bribe people to come and visit because it was a mile and a half walk from school. I remember sitting in our garden in Tottington Road thinking I want to be famous. I can remember that from before I was five. It's very, very clear to me. Yeah, and yet there's no way you can... Any word that had been said by somebody or anything? I don't you'd remember seen anything. Or... I mean, I don't know if it's partly been the youngest of four and feeling, you know, sort of a bit anonymous and wanting to make my mark and feeling that I couldn't really compete with the rest of my family and mm. so I had to do something different. I had to find another way through. It might mm. be that. Mm. And did this, with this idea of being famous, did it communicate itself to the people around you, your friends, your. No, I your never used to tell sister. people that. I never told people that. It was a, it was a big secret. It was, a, it was always a very solitary thing. When did the idea occur to you of being a stand-up comic? Just... Well, I think, I mean, I didn't know there was such a thing as a child. I, didn't, I certainly didn't know there were women stand-up comics. I saw Joyce Grenfell when I was about six, and that certainly planted the seed of a woman standing on stage alone. That was, I found that very appealing. As a very sort of isolating person, I found that appealing, the idea of standing on stage on my own and not being with other people, I think. I saw her show. And then there was a woman called Libby Morris, a Canadian, who came over in the late 60s. And she had something called a one-woman show. And that phrase really stuck with me. So I had that in my head to do from about 15. And so when you were buffeted at school, as you say, you yeah. were, and uh, that must I had a little feeling inside me that it would be... I mean, people say, well, you're really funny. And I mm. used to treasure all these remarks if I ever got... I used to write them in my diary. If anybody ever complimented me, I used to write it down. On being funny? Yeah. And, and in did. class, did you try to make people laugh? Not so much in class. I wasn't the class joker. There were certainly lots of people who were funnier than me. I, I used to tie people up and put them in cupboards, so I wasn't exactly witty. <laughs> I didn't, did I did. Really. <laughs> Sorry, Gail Melling, but I did. <laughs> so we got down this big jar of acid, and somehow, I think it were leaking or something, because I don't know, somehow, this big hole come in Rosie Sutcliffe's blazer, and, uh, like, all the lettering come off of a form captain's badge. And uh, somebody said, that is dead dangerous, that is. We must, like, rinse that off with water. And so I looks like helping her hold her head under the taps. And, uh, <laughs> and, and a sock had got in her mouth. <laughs> hey, ho, I don't bloody know God gives us all a place on earth like Chorley. How sad <laughs> the life I might have had if I had been swapped to birth to Lawley. Ho, hum, I've got it all to come. Tomorrow is another day. Well, I'm five foot five and I'm still alive. And that's all I want to say. When Victoria was five, her family left the neighbourly terrace in Tottington Road. When she was 11, her mother went to college and subsequently trained as a teacher. 
Her father was an insurance salesman who also played part-time in a dance band. I used to play the piano with him. That was the main thing that I did with him. Because he, he was a frustrated entertainer. He, he'd done shows in the Navy and things like that. He would have loved to have done what I did. I suppose this is the right road. I've never actually driven <laughs> from Tottington to my other house. He wrote the names of the notes underneath a piece of music that I knew, Polly Wally Doodle. I taught myself to read music from that. And I did have lessons, but I couldn't cope. I couldn't cope with being with the piano teacher in the same room. I was too shy. I used to sweat. My hands used to slip off the keys. I was so nervous. So I stopped um, going to piano lessons. And so I started playing on my own. And I thought, well, my parents will be cross if I play the piano because I'm not having lessons. So I used to play piano in secret. And when, when they'd gone out, I used to run to the piano. I used to dream about playing the piano. And then when I heard their car come up the drive here, I used to get off the piano and close the lid and the piano would be still steaming. And I'd run to the room and put the television on. For years I did that, just for something that I did in private. And then they said, we know you played the piano. And then I started having lessons again when I was 30. I played anything, anything I could read. I was very good at sight reading. Having lessons, are you? Professor Hartley, oh, yeah. Should ask for a refund. <laughs> <laughs> and when we lived in a very strange way, we all lived in separate rooms in my house. We lived in this big house on a windswept hill on the moors. And I had a room with a piano and a television in it. And I had to watch television or play the piano or read or eat sweets. And I just did those four things, usually all at the same time. And I based my career on at least three of them. I was left to my own devices. So I lived in a very odd world. I don't know if I was obsessive because I had nothing else to do or whether I was just like that anyway. I think I have a streak of that in me anyway. And, you know, even if I'd lived on a road and had tons of friends, I think I would have been a bit like it. But it was certainly... It was a way of filling up time as much as anything. Were you worried that your parents sort of stood back so much or not? No, that's just the way it was. And I, I, didn't, I didn't expect anything different, really. Mm. That's what we were used to, that we, were all, we all lived in a very separate way. There's a problem. There's no support vessel, no officials, nobody. Chris is entirely alone. Are you still going to go, Chris? Yeah, I think so. I might as well. The front were easy kidderminster today, so I haven't got anybody to play with anyway. That was eight days ago. And Chrissy hasn't yet reached land. No one seems to know where she is. Oh, I'm sure she'll turn up eventually. <laughs> Slow but sure, that's our Chrissy. Yeah, she's probably just swimming about looking for a nice beach. The ice creams and donkeys, you know our kids are. Was it helpfully isolating looking back? <sighs> I don't know. It's the way it was. And, you know, yeah. from, from this standpoint, it was absolutely fine. You know, I'm, I'm all right. So can you look back and feel any encouragement there from this? There was encouragement thing? in the sense that you could do what you wanted, mm. which, was a, which was a bit scary in a sense, but uh, it made me very... I mean, on the one hand, I, I, I was shy and I didn't go out very much. I didn't have a very normal social life until I went to a youth theatre and when my life changed and the sun came out. But it was, it, you know, at least I, I had freedom to have... A, I had an individual mind, I think, you know. Yeah. I have a good vocabulary because I read all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been very useful to me. What gave you the sort of idea to go to this theatre club when you were about 15? Oh, because my sister went. And I just suddenly thought, oh, yes, this is the thing I can do. This is what I'm good at. After being told at school, oh, you can't do this, you're hopeless at this, you're bad at that, you know, you're so naughty and dirty and messy. And, and I suddenly, you know, this thing clicked. I thought, well, this is the thing I can do. This is The Swish of the Curtain by Pamela Brown. This is my favourite book as a child, and one of my favourite books now, which is about some children who who find a disused chapel and start a theatre in it, open a theatre and write all their own shows, songs, scripts, everything, and act all the parts and make all the costumes. Very true to life. And then, of course, they all go on to go to drama school and become famous actors and actresses. And, and it was my, you know, that was, that was my life. That's what I wanted to do. She took the heavy statue and turned to the applauding audience. What was she expected to do now? Why, of course, behave just as in the word picture she had painted to the others that day at Browcliffe. She curtsied, then looking up to the familiar faces in the gallery, kissed her hand. The applause grew deafening and gradually the people rose in their seats, still clapping. The theatre stood and cheered and stamped, while Lynn bowed and smiled for an eternity. <sighs> Marvellous. I mean, you might think that the reality is only a disappointment after that, but really it's not been. It's as good as this. Which is nice, isn't it? I'm 17 and I live round here and it's 
not so bad And all my sisters left So I'm just at home with my mum and dad But all I'm really looking forward to when I won't be here When I fly, fly away to a better day That's my idea, it's my best idea It's a great idea And all I had this job and it weren't much cop, so I packed it in. And oh, my man went mad. She said, what have you done? Said, I packed it in. I just walked out, I packed it in. Cause oh, somewhere around the corner and headed straight my way. I can see so clear, I won't be here. I'll have a better day, a better day. Does that song come out of something you remember very much of your team? No, it comes out of how I perceive people to be living at the mm. moment, really. It's not from my own life, where I've managed to achieve a lot of the things I wanted to do, but I'm very aware of a generation of people who have no, uh, have no chance of getting away. That's what their song is about. You see that just... Uh, see that around me now, yeah. since, the, since the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Sort of these maroon, this marooned mm. youth, really. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the 70s weren't brilliant, but there was a... There was a a hint that you might one day get a job or that things might improve and they did improve and then they went down again i mean to people it's happened to people twice people lose hope oh what they say at school and like on the news it's all a con because look at me i have these dreams and they won't come true like they say dream on me mum says that dream on andrea dream on andrea and oh Something set me thinking, this thing my grand would say We'll win, it'll all begin When a ship comes in, we'll have a better day Well I'm 17 and I live round here and it's not so bad And my sister's left so I'm just at home with my mum and dad And oh, something set me thinking, this thing that she would say We'll win It'll all begin when a ship comes in We'll have a better day, a better day, a better day relieved to think that I've come off and nothing awful happened. I mean, it, it, I can't deny that it's an effort to do. And it's like, like climbing a series of little hills, you know. I've got, you know, I get the first half out there and think, oh, now I've got that thing in the beret, then I've got that song which is so difficult to articulate, and I've got to make sure I get my mouth around that, then I've got that whole piece and that's got to be chopped up really nicely and not just run into a sort of big bland mess, it's got to be broken up. And then I've got that big song, and then I've got the little song, and then if I get an encore, I've got Barry and Frieda. And then I've got the last thing. So it's, you know, it's not like a show you can, you know, it's not like Valdunican in a rocking chair. You can't really sit back on it. So mainly when I call, I think, yes, we did that. You know, nothing terrible happened. I didn't dry. I didn't forget any of the words. Or anything. And then a bit later on, I think, oh, yeah, and they laughed, you know, I think about that afterwards. But mainly, I just think, God, you know, get your mask on. Have a wash. Go and sign the autograph. And Barton. This will be Jeff then. Hello? Yeah? Hi. It was really good. Yeah. Well, I'm here with the camera crew. Yeah. Don't speak up. Don't speak up. Don't call me Chuchy Bottom. All right then. I've got to go and do the stage door thing. Oh, hello! <laughs> I've been signed already. In Liverpool. Well, they're very nice, I must say. Yes, best it may. People project onto me, they project onto any performer that they see on the television. They have an idea of what they what they think they're like. And what do you think they project onto you? That I'm nice, they think. I'm not, but that's what they think I am. They think I'm nice and friendly. My husband says they think I'm their best friend, you know. Yeah. And that's fine on the stage. I'm happy to be their best friend. And what do you do for them, do you think? What do you help them through? Well, I'm just... I mean, like every comedian, 
it's it's saying this is how our life is and it's it's just, it's, a, it's a really important part of people's lives in comedy so it's an important part for everybody look if i go out of the photo wouldn't i <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, no i don't want you to crouch down oh, no, no, don't you be myself no, that's how i am This cell is so small that one billion would weigh less than a gram. But every year, our research into it gets bigger and bigger. Why? Because this is a white blood cell during an asthma attack. And although we can control the symptoms, every day in Britain, one million parents still wonder if their children will be able to breathe properly. Man has no greater enemy than disease. Disease has no greater enemy than Glaxo Welcome. Relax. Relax. Empty your mind. Empty your mind. Of everyday stress. Sit back and enjoy our therapy session. Sit back and enjoy our therapy session. For a longer session, call 0990 200 200. Thompson's new summer sun brochure shows the scores you give our holidays for as honest a picture as possible. Hi, love. Sorry, love. Duty calls. See the car. Almira. GTI. Let's, Let's go. go. Cover me. Huh? Go faster. I'm doing nearly 30. Naughty boy. Turn left. Why? Litter. Makes the car look good. Time you call this. Sorry, girl. Traffic was murder. Never make professionals. Neither will they. The all action Almira. Tell me about it. Time? Time is not a problem. The real problem is how you use time. I hate cars. In the old days, you had to have a car. If you didn't have a car, you couldn't see your customers. I talk to my customers every day. From the set, I don't have to leave the office. And I can see their faces. I can read their minds. I love speed. If your customers could use information quickly, so could you. Feel free to call AT&T. American Express, how may I help you? We've made an arrangement just for our customers. There are relevant offers on your bill. This month, there's one for a garden centre. Yes, we can help you with that. I've arranged a new credit card for you. Unless you spread payments over time. Or perhaps you prefer our charge card. Don't worry, we'll get that replacement card to you before you leave on your business trip. Would it help to move your billing date? To the beginning. To the middle of the month? Whatever's best for you. Because we know everyone is different, we help you do more. Starting in the 10p times tomorrow, get up to 50% off short breaks at over 350 Johansson's hotels. Because this is real life, which is always such a mess, badly designed, under rehearsed, no proper tunes. We live in real life. Which is not a nice address, needs doing up, needs some white paint, needs a few blues. Life is a fan club and I'm not a fan. Victoria Wood started writing her show back in January. In March and April she performed parts of the new material at a series of Sunday night tryouts at venues close to London, rewriting and adding new material each week. We joined the long term on M4. You can't do comedy without an audience. I'll assemble a show that's 
full of old stuff so that I know it's going to go well and I might put in more new bits, less old bits. At St Albans, she decided to experiment with one of her routines by playing it as a character rather than in her own voice. This called for an extra stage prop. I'm probably hiding in the piano. On. We're a new, well, not a new bit of old bit. It's the pointiest one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I need more elastic. Well, we knock on the door, and this nurse answers. And she's wearing a party hat. And she's got a glass of formaldehyde in one hand with a cherry in it, and an earlobe in the other. Says, I don't know how it happens, there's always something left over. <laughs> So I'll put it to tell you that, and then I'll put the hat on. And that's going to transform me instantly into another person. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to be in the first or second That's half? in the first half. I'll give you a running order, but when I ran through it this morning, it went, it went on forever, the whole thing. So I might have to, you know, snip a bit out. It was one hour, 20 minutes when I went right through the whole thing. What was it last week? In the end. I don't know, it felt like forever. It was about 1.10. Yeah, it was about 1.10. <laughs> I was like, night. I was expecting terrible like 1.15. Night. <laughs> Please get me off this stage. I thought to myself, just shut up. <laughs> you <laughs> just hear my voice going, oh, that'll be quiet. <laughs> get off this bloody stage. Because this is real life, which is always going to be like a toupee, hurting your head, showing the joint. Because in real life, there will always be a knee coming your way, aiming itself straight for your groin. It's a windowless room in the Hotel Bellevue. It's an ass-kicking party thrown specially for me and you. Now, I must tell you, I'm under a bit of a strain tonight. Got a film crew with me filming a fly on the wall documentary. It's a bit of a panic. Flies just died. <laughs> <laughs> it fell off the wall. But it's uh, such a worry having a film crew with you wherever you go. You have to watch what you say. I haven't said bollocks since Thursday. Is there any way you can identify what makes a good joke, or is that impossible? It's rhythm, really. It's rhythm, it's unexpectedness, it's the, it's the sound of a word, it's like Neil Simon saying consonants are funnier than vowels. It's picking all those things, it's having a sense of what will work. It's surprise, it's having things coming off the offbeat instead of the onbeat. It's, 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 it's a lot to do with music, really. The only thing I could find to put on this morning was a body. No, yeah, body. Got it on there. Fantasy, this is by Fantasy, this body. I have got one by, made by Burley. You feel such a fool, don't you, in a department store, going up to a woman saying, have you got a large, white, burly body? <laughs> such a faff, aren't they, bodies, to get, on and out, to get on and to get off? I mean, I've got friends who wear tights and knickers and a body and, like, a little dress or trousers, and they go out for a few drinks and they sit there and they go, oh, sod it, Angela, let's just wet ourselves. <laughs> when I first started in stand-up, I used to sit down. I couldn't leave the security of sitting on the piano stool. Then I graduated to standing in the crook of the piano, but I had, had it around the sides of me, so I had something to hold on to. Then I always had a stand mic, so there was always a barrier between me and the audience. And then I actually relaxed into the freedom of not holding anything, and it's, it's, it makes it much more physical, which I really enjoy. I'm collecting. We're not allowed to like call out and draw attention to ourselves. But we can do like, quite an interesting rattle. Plus, I'm looking for my friend. Have you seen her? Kimberly. She's really, really tall, she's really, really platinum. She said like these hair extensions. <gasps> to ages to do to eight hours. Well, far for each armpit. 
So she's got this new job now. She's working in a health club and gym, really, really upmarket. It's converted from an abattoir. <laughs> so there's loads of hooks for your leotard. <laughs> During these early tryouts, Victoria's husband, Geoffrey, himself a professional performer, provides an outside eye to assess audience reaction and help shape the final show. I'm not the director. I just notice things that occur to me. And if, when I tell her, she thinks they're worth noting, she will take them into account. If, say, half the audience is laughing, but another half of the audience isn't laughing, I'll try and work out why that is. A sweet old couple had a party Cos they'd been married 60 years Sat hand in hand and hale and hearty The local press were all in tears The woman from the news said, Ivy What's helped your marriage last so well? She looked at her husband then said with a wink Regular sex with the Coleman, I think. We've done it. The first half will be, well, the first half will end up about 55. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Which is exactly what you want. Yeah. It was much better. The hat. Yeah. It was. But somehow those lines are much better coming out from someone else's mouth I than know. yours. I know, but we don't like to hear me say arse, you know. <laughs> this is probably... It's my beauty tip, Amy. Have I given you my beauty tip? No. You have to wash your face for a minute. A minute. And that's it, to loosen, loosens all your, your dirt, that's if you pause. Like a bit of a mess, though, yeah, you? yeah. What do you wash yours in? Well, any old thing. <laughs> it doesn't matter as long as it's for a minute, you know. Brillo powder, and I'll do it. Please welcome Victoria Wood. There's a tin in the office cupboard. Because I've gone and got engaged again I wonder what they'll give me Money would be ideal Probably be something practical In stainless steel She just finished at Birmingham University uh, After gaining an honours degree in drama You would expect her to go on possibly to the old Vic or somewhere like that, but no. Because on the day I might fade away and be just a veil and a pile of bones. What did you get from university? So you're really glad you went to university. I didn't actually participate because people kept saying, well, you can't act, you know, you have to go and do stage management. You're not, you're no good at Chekhov. They were very dismissive. Mm. I just went off on my own and played the piano and ate more and just more, more eating, more songwriting. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what I can do in When I went on New Faces, they said, well, you're very good, but I don't think you'll ever work because there's nowhere for you to work. Somebody said, this woman is doing sophisticated cabaret and there's no such thing in this country. It's all, you know, it died with Noel Coward, it's all gone. Mm. And so I was constantly being told that either I didn't look right or I didn't sound right or there was nowhere for me to work. And I didn't, they were right. I was out of work for four years. So you just potted around for the... I potted around miserably. Yeah. How did what you cope do. with it? Well, I just, you know, partly apathy and partly stubbornness, really. And then, luckily, I met Jeff, and then I, that gave me a boost to mm. carry on. But I, w I was really anxious. By the time I was 23, I remember saying to him, I'm 23, and this is all over. You know, I've had, I'd had about four lucky breaks, and nothing had happened out of any of them. Especially That's Life, which was getting 15 million, and I still hadn't got an agent or got myself together. I'll be back at Social Security, queuing up to be abused, to be listed on a card index. Well, 
qualified me to drink shandy and that's all. When you went from the bed sitter to the studio, did you sort of change I personality? Did on the train, yes. <laughs> I felt much more comfortable because I felt, well, this is the thing I can do. I can write songs and sing and I can play the piano. And then I felt I was in the right place. The rest of the time I felt I was rather floundering. Slowly her act stopped being a lot of songs strung together and started to become something that was about her rather than about a lot of songs. And when, a, when an entertainer starts talking about themselves, then they're getting good, because then they're having the nerve to be honest. Nobody arrives fully fledged on the planet as a good comedian. Mm. So I had to go through some sort of turmoil the first few years. I don't, mm. re don't regret being out of work or anything like that. It just took me a long time to learn the job. It's easy to forget that she was the first female stand-up comic. There was Beryl Reed, who was a huge star, doing character. There was Joyce Grenfell, who was doing characters. There was nobody until Victoria did it who stood behind a stand mic and told gags, and she had to invent it for herself. Because when you buy a house, and anybody who's bought a house will know this, you do it almost at random, you know. I mean, I've spent longer choosing shoe polish than what I have houses. You go in a house and you say, oh, I love their hoover. We'll buy it. Yes, please, thank you. When Jeff met me, he decided to stop being an actor and start being a magician. And his first big job was to do a summer season at the end of the pier in Morecambe. And uh, we took a little flat. And again, apathy and isolating and things. We just stayed there. And we sort of made a joke out of it. We pretended we liked it, but we didn't really like it. Because we were really lonely, but we couldn't say it. That was a mad decision. That was a mad, stupid decision. That street to the left of the market. That's Oxford Street. That's where we used to have a flat. Jeff and I had a flat on the first floor. And a woman next door to us got very upset because the TV Times came to do an interview about me. And they said, Victoria would live next door to a house with sauce bottles in the window. Which it did have sauce bottles in the window. But she was mortified that they'd actually put this in black and white. She thought it was my fault. Anyway, we left there. And then we bought a house in Silverdale. Not a very good place for comedy, no. There's no comedy in scenery. You need people for comedy, really. I suppose I wanted to be odd in, the, in a way. I wanted to cut myself off, I wanted to be separate. I didn't have the nerve to go to London, really. Is, what is it that was. what it was? I didn't was. want to compete. What I'm slightly surprised about is that you regretted to talk, given the amount of material that seems to me to come through. <laughs> yes, we should have had a bit of a life, that's all. <laughs> and a great act and no life. I was posed endlessly on piers in front of shooting galleries, you know, and that, that was Northern Funny Girl, that's who I became, I was a Northern Funny Girl. Pretend to be Northern, just smile and act dense, just say something Northern, it doesn't have to make sense, make a list of Northern cliches, and you can't go wrong, put in any order, you've got a Northern song, you just go track, clogs, going to the dogs, bring it. The first leg of Victoria Wood's British tour finished in July, nearly five months after her first tryouts. The final performances were in Manchester, a few miles from the town where she was brought up. Do you like the palace? The theatre we used to go to when we were little, to do the pantomime. We used to sit at the back, right at the top, in the gods. You know, there was no party bags or no consolation prizes, none of this, everybody has to go home with something. I mean, when you played musical chairs, if you were out, you were out. I mean, like, out in the streets, go on. <laughs> it's raining, Mrs Pickering, I mean it. People would expect me to say, didn't that feed your sense of being brought up there? Didn't that give you a head and shoulders start in <laughs> yes, humour? Yes. <laughs> being in Ramsbottom and all that northern humour that we're all supposed yeah. to I mean, wasn't that a flyer of a start? Well, was it? Well, it was very, like I say, it was very isolated, you know, we were on this hill. We didn't have any neighbours. Nobody ever came to the house. Um, but certainly, I found when I started writing that I had been fed in all sorts of ways. I was not even aware that people were coming out of my pen that I had not ever been aware of hearing. But all those voices and all those people, they had soaked into me somehow. And you know when you do pass 
that's the parcel now. You have to put a little prize in each layer so that each child who unwraps a layer gets a prize. None of that when I was little. You were lucky if you got one at the end, you know. You'd unwrap the last thing and go, there's nothing in it, Mrs. Pickering. No, that's life, that is. Think on. <laughs> this, did you? Why? Well, when I won the colouring competition in the evening news, I was invited backstage to meet Harry Seacombe at the Palace Theatre as part of the prize. Sleepy time elves I had to colour in. So I remember having terrible trouble with the stripes on the pyjamas. Of course, that was before felt tip. Well, we went to see Freddie Garrity once. You know, Freddie and the Dreamers, in his dressing room. And that was like somebody's sitting room. So the telly and the beds and everything. I went off him, though, because he had a string vest. Talent, Victoria Wood's 1978 stage play about the backstage experiences of a talent contest competitor and her friend was recorded for television by Granada. The head of drama there, Peter Eckersley, immediately commissioned her to write two new plays, especially for television, and then her own series. <laughs> Hi, chaps. Evening. Welcome to Wood and Walters, the comedy show with a difference. It's offbeat. It's zany. It doesn't get laughed. <laughs> but we did some of Wood and Walters, I think, in here, even though it's so tiny, and they just had little tiny, two little strips of audience, and the, the audience were ancient. They were about 80. And, the, and the, somebody came out, the warm-up man, and said, now, we're going to do a sketch set in a boutique. And they went, what's a boutique? And nobody laughed at any of the sketches, and one woman turned to them and said, we're missing brides, Ed, for this. Can I help you? Um, I just wondered if you had these in a 14. You what? <laughs> this is a boutique, not the elephant's house. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Eileen, we've got another fat so in. I would set myself up as a victim, and Julie would be the cruel one, and I would be the one who was being cruel to it. And, um, I, I think that was just something that, like, you know, that was my own chip on my shoulder and my own insecurity about being fat or being northern or what, whatever that I felt insecure about. I worked through in those sketches and later on I didn't need to do that. I'm starting to feel quite bad about what I look like. Oh, God. <laughs> you need an awful lot of material. You need to, I now throw, I write double, at least double and throw half of it away and I think that's the best way to raise the standard. I didn't do that on one water because I didn't know you had to. I learnt from that when I came to do Victoria Wood have seen on TV. Excuse me, sir, I'd like to test. Excuse me, sir, I'd like to test. Oh! <laughs> what the hell is that? It's an anti-mugging spray, sir. The fact is, Mrs. Earl, my life seems completely grey, bleak and pointless. Well, yes. Sometimes that's God's way of getting you to enjoy Gardener's world. <laughs> One of the things that's marked your career is the, the loyalties that you've had to people you've worked with. What about the relationship with Julie Walters? Well, I, I think technically she's admirable. I think she's so clever with her voice and everything. Right, Julie goes into the window and bats about. I mean, that's really funny physically when she actually does it. Hello, there's a pair of shoes in the window. Yes, that's right, we do that because it's a shoe shop. <laughs> <laughs> They're a black lace-up, 15.99. Are they? Yes. Can I try them on? On your feet? <laughs> yes. All right. Why not? <laughs> it was like it was specially for me. And everything she writes feels like it's specially for me. That if I could write like that, this is what I would write. Sorry, the black ones, they're a flat lace-up. Beg pardon? Well, those aren't flat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can draw things out of myself, but mainly I have to draw out of me, my life now and the way I live now, as, certainly as far as stand-up goes. Mm. I can't, you know, people, people, when I moved from the north, people say, well, what will you write about? I said, well, I'll just write about what is, what is now. Where I live, it's really filthy, mainly because of traffic, so much traffic. And, you know, all the traffic where I live is these women in these huge four-wheel drive jeeps driving their children to school. Now, why do they have to have four-wheel drive in London? I don't understand, you know, unless they're worried about encountering a low-sugar Ibina slick coming up Highgate Hill. What eventually got you to make this huge leap and come 
all of 250 miles <laughs> south to London. Um, I was always packing up one child and travelling with her up and down the motorway. And it's not a nice drive, you know, it's five hours at least to get to London from Silverdale. Mm. I said, we've got to live an ordinary life where we just, you know, we take them to school around the corner and we go into work and we, you know, we come back at, at the end of the day. You know, a meeting takes half an hour to travel to and not five hours. Mm. I was just trying to turn into a normal person, really. Do you think success helped you to turn into what you call a normal person? No, it didn't at all, because I was successful for ages and still barmaid, so it wasn't really that. You, would, you describe yourself as a barmaid? Mm, mm, but not now. <laughs> Where did the barmaidness come from, do you think? Um, it's, it's partly been very driven and very set on one thing, to the exclusion of everything else. And also, I've realised now, living in a world of books, I lived, I, I learned everything I knew about life from books, and so life was a constant disappointment to me. She, it has changed, she has become, the, but I think that's the key of it, that, that, that she's happier with herself and more confident in herself. And so she's, you know, able to give out, and I mean, it's a terrifying thing to have to go out and stand on a stage anyway. You'd have to be mad to be totally confident in the first place, wouldn't you, really? <laughs> Oh dear, you see, I'm not a proper celebrity, you see, that's the trouble. You see, real celebrities, they do things like getting drunk and dancing naked on tables, which I just don't do. Anyway, the tables in Pizza Hut are really wobbly, aren't they? <laughs> see, if I, if I was a real celebrity, I'd have to have at least four children. One naturally, two adopted, one from sperm sent in by a well-wisher. <laughs> and I'd have to call them Pinky Perky, Monosodium Glutamate and Satsuma. What attracts you about uh, writing about celebrities? It's something that's happened to me, so I can see it from the inside. But also, I'm not particularly taken in by it. But I'm, I'm just interested how people, whether, you know, people who read their own press and people who believe their own reviews. Mm. I, sexy yet vulnerable, and I'm quoting from Harper's here. I, Pat Bedford of Glamour, who came sixth in the world's most envied bottom pole, 1992, just two below Claudia Schiffer have now been publicly linked with a woman whose buttocks practically skim the carpet. And were you particularly pleased with Pat and Margaret? It brought together a lot of themes that were in your shows, didn't it? The lonely, isolated girl. It did, yeah. And then this, uh, this glamorous television, yeah. well, in this case, film world yes. star. Yes. And um, also, what, what effect does it have on somebody to be famous? To be brought together with somebody who's not famous? I was very interested in the clash of that and how people perceive themselves when they're famous. Yes, Margaret Mottershed, motorway waitress, the sister you haven't seen for 27 years, now one of the highest paid actresses in American television. A very special magic moment. Here she is from Glamour, the glamorous Patricia Bedford. The first premise of Pat and Margaret was two people being reunited on a television show. It was a, a, um, dealing with families and history, people's past, bumping up against people's presence. Isn't that our best one? There's a sense in which Pat and Margaret, to some extent, both you. Mm, it was both me. Yeah, it was. It was that. It was that battle between the the, the, the one who, who who can never get on, the, the, the sort of impotent person, and the one who's so determined to get on. There's no room for anything else. It was sort of. Yeah. And so you would. I mean, you, that it's sort a bit of perspicacious. Pun. A bit perspicacious. You signed this. It's just to say, we're not related, I haven't got a sister, you have no claim on Pat Bedford, Inc. That's my company. You're not signing this. What? You have got a sister. I am your sister. You know I am. You recognised me straight away, didn't you? You don't have to sign it until Claire brings the cheque people behave as if what was written about them was true and we all know we're all little frightened vulnerable people but some people will, will read what you know they're billing on the poster and actually believe it when it, at the end of the day we all have to go home you know the theater lights go out we all go home who are you then i was just interested in that and somebody who blocked off their past and and was acting as if they were just our famous person well nobody is just that everybody has a history and that's what i wanted to get into We've got four more nights here in Manchester, then we finish, then there's a break for the whole of the summer holidays, and then we pick it up again in Cambridge as a warm for the album. This is the middle of July, and I started writing it in the middle of January. I started trying it out at the beginning of March, and I've been on the road since the beginning of May. So it's been a long time. I feel I'm ready for, for it to finish now.
it's been very tiring because most of the time I've commuted home every night and that has been really tiring because it's very boring apart from else coming back in a car every night and then you know getting up at half past six seven o'clock when you've only got back at one it's just it's just tiring but this, but this week I've had a rest because I've been away from home all week so, so I'm actually feel good this week I'm, I'm all right it's just it's been really good I haven't got really any complaints about it I mean I do get tired because well, I, well, it is lonely. It just is lonely. I mean, I think that's the nature of the job. South Bank Show, in association with the Sunday Telegraph, the art of a perfect Sunday. If you would like a copy of the South Bank Show's souvenir publication, please write a cheque for three pounds made payable to BSS and send to the South Bank Show, P.O. Box 7, BSS, London W5 2GQ. Next Friday night.